It is my pleasure to introduce our first speaker for this fall 2020, Dr. Amy Mons. Dr. Amy Mons is an associate professor of English at the University of Southern Indiana, where she teaches 18th to 19th century British literature, teaching methods, young adult literature, and argument. Her research interests include material culture of the 18th to 19th centuries, particularly fashion and young adult literature. She is currently working on a manuscript entitled Dressing for England, Fashion and Nationalism in Victorian Novels. Her recent co-edited collection with Dr. Dana Lawrence, Adaptation in Young Adult Novels, Critically Engaging Past and Present, was published by Bloomsbury yesterday, September the 3rd. Congratulations. Please welcome Dr. Amy Munz. Everybody, um, thank you so much for coming. Uh, this means a lot to me, um, especially being the first one and, and the format and all of that good stuff. So it's really great to see all of you here. I appreciate it. I am going to get started. Um, I will talk a little bit further about this, um, but it is a convention in my field to read our papers. Um, so I, you know, I don't have a PowerPoint for you. So um, I will try to be as entertaining as possible. Adapting historical time and place in young adult novels. I was awarded a Laura, which is a liberal arts research award in spring of 2019. And this talk in the book it comes from is a result of that award. This talk comes from the introduction of our collection, Adaptation in Young Adult Novels, Critically Engaging Past and Present, which this beautiful color, cover we're very excited about, as uh, Erska mentioned, was just published yesterday. So we're super excited by that. Um, and it's uh, through Bloomsbury Publishing, and they just have been phenomenal to work with. So that's been really exciting. Um, and, and I'm also including my chapter on adapting New York City for the modern team, which was my contribution um, along with the introduction. And expanded when I discussed adaptation text with a friend and colleague, Dr. Dana E. Lawrence at USC Lancaster. We solicited and received arguments about rewrites of Disney classics, young adult novels that deal with Hurricane Katrina, rewrites of Edith Wharton and F. Scott Fitzgerald and Charles Dickens, as well as work on feminism and contemporary young adult novels. I'm going to begin by reading you a bit of our co-written introduction, which outlines our argument about adaptation, and then I'll read you my chapter on New York City. It is convention in my field to read text rather than present from a PowerPoint. In English, the words, the language you use are just as important as the argument. So, um, in, uh, so this is gonna come from our book. Um, I had received the Laura to work on the, um, the chapter, which was going to originally be an article, and then I, I talked with my friend and we turned it, we managed to turn the whole thing into a book proposal and got accepted during the Laura semester, so that was super exciting. In the theory of adaptation, Linda Hutchinson argues that, quote, an adaptation is not vampiric. It does not draw the lifeblood from its source and leave it dying or dead, nor is it paler than the adapted work. It may, on the contrary, keep that prior work alive, giving it an afterlife it would never have had otherwise. Those of us who do work on adaptations. The idea of an afterlife of text, of seeing what comes before as an inspiration for what comes now, is by its very definition, keeping works alive. Adaptations for young adults in particular have the added benefit of engaging the young adult reader with both then and now, past and present, functioning as both monuments to history and the flesh of the reader's lived experience. While this is true for adaptations in general, it is especially important for those written with young adults in mind. Such adaptations allow young readers to make personal connections with text that might otherwise come essential for reaching the target audience because as Andrea Coldwell has observed, quote, that is, interest in reading seems to result from interest in shaping oneself as a reader. The hope is, of course, that the young adult reader will approach both text and context, both original and adaptation, to explore the importance of a theme or a writer or a novel and see the historical, cultural, and literary connotations presented. Adaptation is about these connections, connective tissues leading from one text to another, one author to another, one time to another, we see an adaptation and we are invited to remember and engage with the source and we are obviously reimagines and reinscribes a literary canon the engagement with the canon is a key aspect of the adaptive qualities of the text 
For authors' familiarity with the source of the adaptation, whether text, context, author, or place, lends new life to the canonical text. In Seven Types of Intertextuality, Robert S. Miola understands adaptations as, quote, literary progeny that bear direct and immediate descent from originary texts and that exist in a very conscious counterpoise of tribute and criticism. If an author's revision of his or her own work asserts his or her power and domination, then the reviser of another's work enacts a What remains unique about the adaptation is this tension between tribute and criticism, particularly when issues of race, gender, and other aspects of diversity are brought into play. Seeing the past through new eyes means we must examine the past and all its defects. It means engaging with our predecessors in the rights and wrongs of their literatures. Adaptation in young adult novels, critically engaging past and present, explores the afterlife of text and context. These historical and literary phenomena argue that adapting the classics is a way to engage young adult readers with their cultural past and to see how that past can be rewritten in order to emphasize what can be changed, what and who benefits from change, and how they too can be agents of change. These adaptations empower young readers to make them more culturally, historically, and socially aware through the lens of literary diversity. So this comes from our introduction. Um, the introduction continues to, um, that sets up our thesis of the book and what we plan to do with the book. And then the inter introduction continues to read um, a book that says, it's called Sometimes We Tell the Truth, which is a modern adaptation of Chaucer's The Canterbury Tales. Um, and so um, we, we read um, a character, we read the wife of Bath character in the text and, um, kind of look at how you know the similarities of the wife of bath like how they transpose 700 years right um and the book is genius it's it's really well done if anybody's interested so um what i'm going to read to you now is uh my chapter which was originally what is titled in the book um uh, rewriting new york city for the modern team at the end of her novel set in 1920s new york city libba gray provides an author's note that begins quote a lot of research went into creating the world of the diviners. And then she proceeds to discuss the type of research she conducted to faithfully portray the time, the place, and the subject of her paranormal mystery. She concludes that, quote, there are some dynamic resources out there if you're interested in further research about the time period. A full bibliography can be found on the diviners website, thedivinerseries.com. Happy creepy reading. Reading this after concluding Bray's excellent novel led me to an academic quandary. Why? Why rewrite so faithfully historical New York City for contemporary teenagers? Why include bibliographies and authorial notes that describe the painstaking process of researching the text? This question haunted me throughout my participation in the 2017 National Endowment for the Humanities Institute on Material Culture in 19th Century New York City. I originally intended to research pieces of material culture and young adult novels set in 19th century New York, fashion, jewelry, furniture. But as the Institute used New York City as our classroom, I became fascinated with the material culture of the city itself, especially the few preserved spaces of 19th century material culture, the Tenement Museum, the Merchant House Museum, and the Metropolitan Museum of Art. I began exploring young adult novels set during the 19th century in New York City and discovered that it was not as prolific a genre as I had hoped. Not many novels attempt to explore the New York City of the 19th century, and of course I wondered why. My answer came in exploring those spaces left from that century. There just is not a lot of 19th century New York City left. While these three museums give accurate and authentic creations and recreations of the living spaces of their 19th century denizens, so much else has been destroyed, built over, or repurposed. But still these authors like Libba Bray faithfully research books and tracks, but most importantly, spaces. I argue that because these authors are using as it such, 19th century New York City is a canonical text, faithfully represented in documents, historical tracts, and the buildings of the time. While the majority of historical young adult novels actually prefer the Roaring Twenties as their focus in New York City, um, the mentioned Libba Bray's Diviner series, or Anna Gobertson's Bright Young Things, and while children's literature prefers the New York of the contemporary era, and here I'm thinking of the 1960s with Harriet the Spy, and 1970s with the From the Mixed Up Files of Mrs. Basil E. Frankweiler, Young adult novels set in the 19th century New York explore several of the same issues seen in these texts, agency, freedom of movement, gender dynamics, while at the same time positioning our characters in the real spaces, now museums, left from that century. 
through an exploration of the Merchant House Museum, the Tenement Museum, and the New York Historical Society, I argue that these spaces are canonical texts rewritten for the 21st century young adult reader, carefully researched and preserved in text by the authors. Further, by using historical documents mentioned in the novels, the bibliographies, and the author's notes, I explore how history has influenced the scripting of young adult novels for an audience seemingly hungry for historical accuracy. Why New York City? Introducing the Big Apple to the reader. New York is always presented as a defiant place, a space of hope and freedom for the heroines in particular. In their introduction to their collection, Children's Literature in New York City, Keith O'Sullivan and Patrick White offer an explanation as to why New York is so popular setting for these texts for young readers. Quote, in fact, it is as much an imagined space as it is a real place. Yet there is an inextricable link between the imagined and the real. The mythology of New York has helped maintain its resilience and survival in reality. It is here in that inextricable link between the imagined and the real that I see these novels I discuss today existing. 19th century New York is both real and imagined. Real because it existed and we have a historical record for it. And imagined because so many of these spaces and places are gone, lost to skyscrapers and pop-ups and new construction. O'Sullivan and White know that the identity of New York is not static. It is a city that is constantly reinventing and remaking itself, both in its urban landscape and in its population. Like the dynamic character of the city itself, these adaptations function as dynamic reinventings and remakings. The authors see the fading landscape of 19th century New York City and turn it into a living and breathing space for their readers. This reinvention and dynamic character of the city is ultimately the purpose of adapting a city from a previous century. Further, New York past and present offers freedom of travel for the young character who by basis of age may not have that freedom to start with. In New York is a Great Place, Urban Mobility and 20th Century Children's Literature, Sonia Sawyer Fritz argues that the novel she studies, quote, far from casting New York as a treacherous or exclusive place, the novels represented the city as a place without boundaries, a place that can belong to the child regardless of racial identity or socioeconomic status. Fritz even notes that the city becomes, quote, portrayed as the child's friend, complicit in the young person's independent navigation of its spaces. Fritz looks at texts written in their historical moment of publication like Harriet the Spy. What we see in a 19th century adaptations is the progression of New York City from treacherous to welcoming because the teenager is gaining agency. Both novels I will discuss feature female teen protagonists and both novels offer different presentations of the restrictions placed on teenage girls in the 19th century. For the most part, the wealth belonging to the girls' families place them in positions of privilege but also restricts their movements the most. With historical accuracy, these novels present the wealthier characters, especially girls, as restricted in movement both in the city and in society, while working class characters, usually represented by boys in the texts, are allowed freedom of movement because A, they are boys, and B, they are poor. Part of the novel's plots involve the attempt to gain freedom of movement within the city, and the female protagonists go through elaborate lengths to disguise, escape, sneak out, or explore their city with their male accomplices. This freedom of movement is, for Eric L. Tribunella, instrumental to the figure of the flaneur within children's narratives. His article, Children's Literature and the Child Flaneur, argues that the figure of the flaneur, the quote, idle wanderer or man about town, defined primarily by two activities, strolling and looking, can also be seen through the figure of the child. Quote, by placing the child in the city and often imbuing the protagonist of urban fiction with both a critical gaze and a sense of wonder, children's literature both confirms the possibility of the child flaneur and makes use of this figure to contend with the ramifications of modernity. For these heroines, they contain both a critical gaze and a sense of wonder as they explore the city before them with the freedom not usually allotted to girls of their class or status. Yet while their male counterparts freely exhibit Flaneur characteristics, these girls learn and learn quickly how to navigate the streets in order to, in no small part, escape the oppressive life they, they lead. Even the concept of New York City in literature is offered as a structured escape for children. The 2003 Storied City, a children's book walking tour guide to New York City, explores famous places as seen through the eyes of fictionalized children in well-known novels. Leonard S. Marcus organizes his guide according to Neighborhood, with James the Giant Peach from Midtown Manhattan and from the Mixed Up Files for Central Park. 
Marcus begins his walking tour by noting, quote, as a city of superlatives where people have long come to follow their dreams, New York was bound to lodge itself in the world's imagination and to become a favorite setting for literature. He also concludes his work with a bibliography, each book marked with its corresponding age group. This guidebook marketed to and written for children emphasizes the importance of accuracy and impact for an adolescent audience. Storied City's publication argues for adolescent audience that desires literary tourism, but specifically tourism that applies to their age group. In no small way, the bibliographies and acknowledgments of the two novels I examine, as well as Liver Braze, offer the same aspect of literary tourism for the young adult reader. These are real spaces influencing fictional texts and allowing for a realistic setting in a fictional novel. By giving the young adult reader something to look for, a painting in the merchant house, a room in a tenement, these novels argue that young adults are as invested in space and setting as they are in characters and plot. Why history? Introducing historical moments to teen audiences. It's important to know that these bibliographies, intense details of setting and acknowledgements listing museums and archival materials are not for the classroom, but for the teen readers themselves. The question of course then becomes why, which seems to be the question that just haunts this entire project. I was just like, why, why, tell me. Why give teen readers this level of detail about the writing process and introduce them to the rather disintegrating 19th century history of New York City? Mira Zaranovsky's history writing that's good to think with, The Great Fire, Blizzard, and An American Plague, argues that for younger readers, past and present often offer recognizable patterns and extreme differences, and quote, this means seeing the past in terms of both continuity and change. But this seems a didactic approach, and these novels and their research histories are anything but. While it is important that young adult readers see the past in terms of both continuity and change, much of that is lost in writing about 19th century New York City. Outside of the three museums, the Tenement, the Merchant House, and the Met, the New York City of these novels is practically unrecognizable in today's Manhattan. Progress is often at the price of the past, but there are no declarations of villainy. New York is defined by progress. These novels encourage it. In the Cambridge Companion to the Literature of New York, Cyrus R.K. Patel writes that, quote, arising from the rich variety of experiences to be found on the streets and in the neighborhoods of the city, New York writing dramatizes the way in which difference, whether it is based on culture, ethnicity, race, gender, sexuality, or class, is not a problem to be solved, but rather an opportunity for individual and cultural growth. This companion text is rich with discussions of known and rather unknown texts of New York, ranging from Whitman and Wharton to working class observations and Penny Paper's investigative journalism of the 19th century. Patel argues for cosmopolitanism in New York that, quote, arises from the points of contact among its different neighborhoods and among the cultures and subcultures they represent. This cosmopolitanism of New York is perhaps the commonality these novels strive for between past and present. New York City then and now is the true melting pot of America and seems to have always offered the, quote, opportunity for individual and cultural growth. This fact flies in the face of more conservative critics who see the movement toward diversity in young adult literature to be pandering. Chandra L. Powers challenging the pluralism of our past, presentism, and the selective tradition of historical fiction written for young people, asserts that, quote, by challenging works of historical fiction that present minority perspectives and experience, critics raise the issue of presentism, defined by power as, quote, writing about historical events from a modern vantage point. This accusation that some critics face is due to the inclusion of non-white, non-heteronormative, non-male voices in historical young adult fiction. While writers of historical young adult fiction are often are including these voices because they are authentic, they face backlash from those who try to keep history white and heteronormative. Inclusions of research in these texts is, I argue, one way to keep naysayers at bay. The historical narrative pr proves a diverse and thriving historical record, one often silenced by the latter voices of social norms. One way to approach this disconnect is through presenting a wealthy white protagonist exploring historical spaces that she would not normally have access to in a usual narrative. So this section is on the first of the two books that I'm going to discuss um, entitled The Shallow Graves, and this deals with the Tenement Museum. Andrew S. Dalkart in Biography of a Tenement House, an Architectural History of 97 Orchard Street, calls the Tenement Museum, quote, an extraordinary survivor from the first major wave of tenement construction in New York City in the 1860s and 1870s. He further notes that, quote, the fact that 97 Orchard Street retains much of its historic fabric 
provides a unique opportunity to document, analyze, and interpret the housing conditions in which the urban poor lived from the mid-19th century to the early decades of the 20th century. I quote this introduction at length because I think the language Dolkert uses, extraordinary, survivor, unique, is what is truly at stake with the Tenement Museum and for what much of what remains of 19th century New York. Updates and changes in regulations, adding breeze windows, for example, in the apartments, or regulating the amount of people who live in one space, changed the face of 97 Orchard Street almost forever. To truly see how the poor lived, one must actually see. This is the argument made by the very existence of the Tenement Museum. And for those unfamiliar with the Tenement Museum, I'm going to talk um, a little bit further about it, but um, it is a preserved uh, tenement in which they had multiple families living in, and um, it is basically presented as it was found. Some of the rooms were recreated, and um, they have um, like d displays in each of the rooms, um, but some one of the rooms has a hole like in the floor because that's how they found it, right? Um, you can only take certain um, uh, tours through it. You can't tour the entire museum because of its um, delicate nature. So um, it is an astonishing space. It is, of course, in danger of being uh, closed down because it just needs funding. So support the Tenement Museum. In these shallow graves, Jennifer Donnelly offers heroine Joe the chance to explore all aspects of New York City life, from the gilded houses of Gramercy Square to the treacherous waterfronts and poverty-stricken tenements. She travels on a ferry to Brooklyn, strides across the Brooklyn, Br Brooklyn Br Bridge, sorry, walks through a multifamily tenant where her love interest Eddie grew up in desperate poverty, and finally ends at the Tribune where Joe fulfills her dream of becoming a newspaper reporter despite her upper class upbringing. Much of the novel has Joe challenging her conventional upper class heritage, and she struggles against the restraints of class and gender until the end of the novel. Eddie helps her escape some of these confines, not only because he's a boy, but also because he is poor. In Donnelly's novel, boys are free to move about the city, but so too are poor girls. Faye is an artful dodger in the novel, a quick pickpocket and friend of Eddie's from when he still lived in the tenements. When Joe goes to Brooklyn to do some investigative work on her own, she misses the ferry back to Manhattan and almost takes a fatal trip with two murderers when Faye saves her. So this book is very dramatic and I love it so much because of that. Joe tells her, quote, I'm glad you happen to be on Fulton Street and that she, quote, had the feeling someone was watching me. It was you, wasn't it? Faye tells her that not only did she notice Joe, but so did a pickpocket as well as the two murderers. Joe's distracted nature, so focused on the death of her father and solving his murder, again, very dramatic, with her inability to blend into her surroundings, make her an easy mark for the city's more troubled side. Faye takes her home across the takes her home across the Brooklyn Bridge, which Joe declares is exciting because, quote, Papa said it isn't safe for young ladies to stroll across. Faye, flabbergasted, asks, quote, how is a long walk across a boring old bridge exciting? Tell me, Joe Montfort, are all rich people insane? To which Joe replies, quote, walking anywhere on my own is exciting. One of the parts of life Joe craves the most is freedom of movement, which Faye, as a working class woman, has. She takes Joe and what Joe sees as an adventure, not to give her an adventure, but simply to bring her home and keep her out of danger. Joe's insistence on traveling alone while investigating her father's mysterious death culminates in many troubles, but her ultimate trouble comes from home, from her uncle rather than the city's ne'er-do-wells. Donnelly portrays many spaces of homes, including Joe's house, as potentially dangerous because they're easily infiltrated. When Joe visits the tenements with Eddie, she is unprepared for the intense poverty she encounters and that she learns Eddie lived in. Eddie tells Joe that they lived in, quote, one room of an apartment. And when Joe says she wants to go inside, Eddie tells her that she doesn't. She refuses to listen. She, quote, walked up to the stoop and pushed the door open. The smell was eye-watering. Unwashed bodies, urine, and smoke. A small gas lamp sputtered in the dark, airless hallway, illuminating the crumbling walls. A man was sprawled on the dirty staircase in a drunken stupor. Two filthy children sat on the step above him, prodding him with a stick and laughing. Joe, sympathetic, thinks that she, quote, had never seen poverty like this or people so helpless against it. She turned and walked out of the house, grieved to know that Eddie had suffered such poverty himself, amazed that he'd survived it. Donnelly calls attention to the concerns of Gilded Age New York City and the extremes of richness, Joe's life, and poverty, Eddie's life, that exists in the city. 
This direct comparison calls to mind other extremes of wealth for current readers, who while in New York City encounter degrees of rich and poor in every street. Jennifer Donnelly in her acknowledgments calls the Tenement Museum, quote, the most awesome time machine ever. And it is, because Donnelly's description of this tenement is a direct comparison to the physical space of the Tenement Museum. The crumbling walls, the ill-lit gas lamp, now electric but dim, and the small spaces in which multiple bodies were crammed, desperate for a home. Further, in the novel, Jacob Reese's How the Other Half Lives, Studies Among the Tenements of New York, which was published in 1890, features prominently, published the same year the novel is set. Both Joe and Eddie have read it and discuss it as one of the reasons they both went into journalism. Donnelly not only mentions this book, but includes it in a bibliography at the back of her novel, for which Donnelly tells us, quote, the following works provided information and inspiration, and I would like to acknowledge my debt to their authors. In it are a handful of books about tenements of New York. In July 2017, I had the privilege of a special tour of the Tenement Museum. Because of the fragility of the space and the Herculean efforts to maintain it, most tours get to see only parts of the museum. Too many bodies and too many spaces all at the same time could damage the already damaged building. However, because we were with the NEH group, we got to see all the floors, explored several of the rooms on our own and with the guide, and in my case, either got bitten by bed bugs or had an allergic reaction to the wallpaper. It's still unclear, but it, it, there was something. It has no air conditioning, of course, and several of the rooms are left in the manner in which they were found. There are displays, most notably one on clothing to demonstrate how people work from home, and we were to imagine the amount of bodies filling just one of these apartments, large immigrant families plus boarders. And I think that um, for us um, at the Institute, we were um, had roommates, but we all had our own rooms. And then to go into the tenement and realize that like a family of eight would live in a two room house uh, apartment and take in a boarder to have extra money and work from home during peace, peace work, right? Um, I, think, I think that was the thing, like we're so used to our space. I mean, I'm, I, I don't live in New York, so I'm used to space. I live in the Midwest, I lived in Texas, there's just lots of space everywhere. But, um, you know, I think that was probably the biggest shock to us all, was not even the condition of the building, but like how many bodies had to exist in one space. I cannot fully explain what it's like to read about a place and then explore that place in person, except to say that when I researched an article on literary tourism on the lives of Jane Austen and Elizabeth Gaskell, I felt the same way. This trip became not just a historical trip for me, but a site of literary tourism, which in and of itself is both beautiful and problematic. For the novel, it opens Joe's, Joe's eyes to the poverty she's never had to experience firsthand, only read about in books. But further, she enters a living space without permission, walking into people's homes without invitation, becoming a poverty tourist. It becomes a call of action for Jo, and she foregoes a life of leisure for a life of freedom and journalism, writing about the very people she's seen in her travels through New York, but it will always be with privileged eyes. Despite her fall from socioeconomic grace, Jo remains upper class in her breeding, her blood, and her ideology. I too have my privileged 21st century white eyes, and I look at these once private, now public spaces. How does this site of life, especially of poverty-stricken life, become a site of tourism? I felt excited to explore the space because of the history it contained, but also guilty, ashamed almost, of spying on such abject poverty. It reminded me in no small part of the post-Hurricane Katrina tours of the devastated Ninth Ward. Um, and I'm from New Orleans, so I always felt particularly unhappy about those tasteless tours. Jack Kugelmas has similar thoughts in Turfing the Slum, New York City's Tenement Museum and the Politics of Heritage. He asks, quote, if the Tenement Museum is about the preservation of cultural memory and therefore about the inclusion of individuals who might otherwise have been marginalized, then who precisely are the people whose experiences the museum intends to legitimize? The answer has much less to do with actual people who lived in 97 Orchard Street, some 10,000 people since it was built, most of them Jews, according to the research of the museum's consulting genealogist, than with the complex politics and agendas of the museum's creators. He later argues that, quote, whatever its intention, the Tenement Museum is organically connected to American Jews and to what may, may remain the uniqueness of their immigrant experience. The museum's attempts to remain true to the reality of the tenement are admirable, and it offers different tours inspired by people who lived and worked in the tenement. But at the end of the day, it still becomes poverty tourism if it's not approached as a moment for education rather than mere observation. Donnelly's book offers the same sort of education to her young adult readers without becoming didactic. When Joe returns from the building, Eddie asks her, quote, have a good look, 
and one could imagine the, quote, edge that had crept back into his voice that Joe ignored. A smart reader is asked to think through a few things in this moment. One, whether Joe is slumming in poverty tourism for a boy she likes, or if she's really affected. Donnelly writes that, quote, Joe realized she had tears in her eyes. She blinked them back, not wanting Eddie to see them. He was proud and would think they were tears of pity, not sorrow. Eddie's story of growing up in poverty changes her, and it can in turn change a reader. Eddie tells her that he wanted to become a reporter, quote, to tell the stories of the people in that house, the ones that never get told. I want to tell the world that these people exist. Nellie Bly's doing it. Recent Chambers are doing it. They're changing things. I want to change things too. These experiences inspired Joe to leave a life of privilege and to work with Eddie in the New York Tribune. The novel tells us, quote, that girl was gone, and so were the illusions she had carried. Even Eddie sees this change in her. He compares her to Nellie Bly, the undercover journalist who published 10 Days in a Madhouse, which if you have not read, is a must read. After going undercover on Blackwell's Island in a lunatic asylum. In no small way, Eddie sees the comparisons because like Bly, Joe is subjected to an insane asylum where she's falsely admitted to cover up the murders committed by her uncle. I told you it was very dramatic. So there's like an insane asylum, there's a murderous uncle, there's like possible connections to weirdnesses. I mean, it's just amazing, so. Jennifer Donnelly ends her book with hope. Hope for a possible romantic future between Eddie and Joe. Hope for Joe's future in journalism. Hope for change because of the hard work of investigative journalism. But further, she ends her book with an author's note in which she names the real life inspirations for Joe and her story, and acknowledgments in which she thanks the many historical museums that inspired her, and a bibliography for further reading. She inspires her young adult audience to find the true stories of 19th century New York City through the pages of her novel and beyond, through the places, spaces, and voices of 19th century New York. This next section is on the appearance of Annie Van Sinderen and two New York historical sites, which is the New York Historical Society and the Merchant House Museum. Um, for those of you who don't know, the Merchant House Museum is a absolutely unique space. Um, it's preserved pretty much between the 1830s and the 1860s. The family died and the daughter lived and did not change the house. So we have original furniture, original, um, you know, uh, uh, wainscoting we have original um, molding in the house like it's just in a phenomenal space and it's been preserved so beautifully. Catherine Howe concludes her novel about the intersections of 19th century and the 21st with acknowledgments to quote a number of institutions and scholars who made the historical aspects of the book possible and refers directly to the Merchant House Museum of which she points out that it's quote meticulously preserved 1830s interior allowed me a clear imagination of the inside of Annie's house. And I'm grateful to them for working to preserve the rare, the rare heritage of 19th century architecture in New York City. One of the ways the museum preserves their space is through donations, house tours, and a few times a month, ghost tours. In July 2017, I had the unique opportunity in unbearable heat. The Merchant's House Museum registered 94 degrees on the second floor at seven o'clock at night to attend a ghost tour at this unique and well-preserved space. This was a delight for me, not only because I'm interested in these types of spaces, but also because it came so soon after reading Howe's novel about ghosts themselves. Although to be fair and how um, in her uh, acknowledgement, she says that it's a ghost story that never uses the word ghost. So I find that kind of interesting. The space is gorgeous because it's preserved, unique because it's been preserved since the 19th century, and historical because the surviving daughter did very little to change the house. So much of the original furniture, decorations, and interior spaces remain intact. The ghost tour I attended was in fact my third visit to the merchant's house and my second during the NEH Institute. And our a historian colleague from the Institute and I decided to attend the ghost tour for research purposes. We also did a walking ghost tour to, through Greenwich Village, which was amazing. Um, and I felt the place come alive in ways I had not before, no pun intended. We began in the lower floor with a short video about the ghostly encounters in the house over the years, and then went through the rest of the house by candlelight. While we saw no ghosts that we are aware of, we saw the house as it would have been seen in the original 19th century, darkened with candlelight, its only illumination. In Howe's novel, The Merchant House inspires the house where Annie, the 19th century ghost, lives during her time period and where the male main character, Wes, finds her in the 21st century. She is out of place and out of time, flashing in and out of view, first at a seance, and what we've come to learn was the bedroom in her family home, and then sitting on the steps outside the house. She appears in the pizza parlor that has taken over the first floor of her house, 
and she's unable to distinguish between the bells of the door and those that chime to call her to dinner. Past and present begin to converge for Annie, and she's caught between two centuries, both at her house in the 19th century and at the pizza parlor and apartments where Brandon has become in the 21st. I can't see anyone, she says. I'm alone, but somehow I'm surrounded by people and smells, and I can hear a bell jangling, but I can't tell if it's the bell mother uses to summon us for meals or if it's something different. The novel begins with Wes's point of view, and then after Wes and Annie have a few odd encounters, the, narrator, the narration switches to Anna J, her full name, though she prefers Annie. When she first appears back home, she finds herself in, quote, mother's bedroom, in our house on First and the Bowery, not my aunt's in Hudson Square, where we all went to be safe after the, and there's an ellipsis, and trailing off what we later discover is a physical threat against her father for political leanings. The sampler on her mother's wall from Daniel 12.2 is rather ominous for a girl who finds herself skipping through centuries, quote, and many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. But also among the sampler are other artifacts of the 19th century, which Annie describes for the reader, quote, the room looks the same as when we fled a week ago. Lottie's left sand on the floor, which will make mother wild. She hates to see residue cleaning. The coverlet is pulled up over the bed with lotted lace stretched all the way up to the bolster. Lottie's left the key in the bed frame too because mother's always after her to tighten the ropes. Enamel bowl and pitcher on the washstand empty, knotted lace doily on the dressing table, on the doily a pair of gloves, a silver hand brush, and the cut glass bottle of perfume. Some of the details seem to come straight from the Merchant House Museum itself as seen in person and on their website. The house has been featured many times in various different media to sell its preservation mystery, mission and its ghost story. It seems only fitting that such a house would inspire this novel as well. House details of a 19th century bedroom down to the sand used as cleaner on the floor walks the young adult reader back through time. Even the reference to the key to make the ropes tighten offer a glimpse into the common saying, sleep tight. Annie finds herself skipping through time and bedrooms and wakes completely to her own bedroom shared with her sister. She tells us, quote, the room that Beatrice and I share is on the third floor with two tall windows looking over the kitchen garden and privy at the rear of the house. Windows dressed in dark wool hangings now that the weather's turned cool. Mother is still choosing the furniture for the drawing and dining rooms, but she's already appointed her and Papa's rooms. Their beds are heavily carved and draped as old Spanish galleons topped with plumes of ostrich feather. Other clues to the time period, a sampler on the wall, a washstand in the corner, a sewing basket by the rocking chair, are all inspired by items found in the Merchant House itself, because the Merchant House is, like the Tenement Museum, a time capsule to the past. Offering these details is instructing young adult readers in a way that is not didactic, simply informative. What they choose to do with this information is up to them. These details let readers enjoy the books and not feel lectured to, and offer them spaces for further inquiry should they desire. A more didactic text with a set agenda would turn off young readers who approach the novels for fun, reading, rather than schoolwork. Annie's explorations of both centuries of New York take her far afield to a private cemetery, the Bowery, and the New York Historical Society as she navigates the reason why she is unable to find rest in death. Partly this is due to the missing cameo ring given to her by her forbidden working class Jewish level, Hersher. It's a red shell cameo ring we later discover she is the ancestor of the freegan herbal survivalist Maddie, who is the daughter of old New York money. They recognize it in a painting hanging in Maddie's home and also see evidence of the cameo ring on Annie's brother's fingers. Maddie recalls that the ring is most likely at the New York Historical Society, adding another layer of research to this novel. Maddie arrives to find her family's heirlooms and we discover the reason Maddie has shunned their money. They come from a heritage of quote, slave mongers. At the Historical Society, the ring falls out of its box and comes to land in Annie's phantom toes. Quote, the gold band is dented and crushed into an almost oval shape and a thick layer of grime lines the setting that holds the red sliver of shell in place. The carving is less fine than I remember. The white form of Persephone dulled and chipped in places. The shell red background has faded to a burnished oaken brown. There is only one cameo ring in the New York Historical Society database. There's also a brooch a session number 9, 1950 296 dated 1780 to 1880, so an entire century possibility. It is made of shell and gold and described as, quote, oval cameo brooch once belonging to Arabelle Ludlow Lewis, descendant of Francis Lewis and Gabriel Ludlow, depicting profile female bust with flowers and hair, 
perhaps the goddess series Demeter carved in shell. Three dimensional gold frame and round cameo depicting twining lilies pin attachment. Most importantly, the gallery note tells us that, quote, this cameo brooch belonged to Arabella Ludlow Lewis, ancestor of the donor, a descendant of Francis Lewis, a signer of the Declaration of Independence. What the Historical Society does and what its role in the novel tells us it does is to preserve New York City's history through objects. Objects are of importance as are places and homes and the roles of the cameo ring in the novel is significant both because it helps Annie return to her time and death and because it calls for preservation of historical artifacts. The appearance of Annie Van Sinderen ends with both an author's note that discusses her own encounters with ghosts and haunted places and acknowledgments which give thanks to the people and places that made this book possible. It is in these liminal spaces that I truly wish to walk. To return to this essay's initial question of why, I'd like to pose it again. Why such an author's note that offers personal insight into the author's life and indeed her home? Why is it necessary to tell teenage readers that the Merchant House Museum was the inspiration for Annie's home? Part of it is, of course, citation. Authors, whether creative or academic, should give credit where credit is due. Yet there is something more important happening here, an assistance of reading these texts for their historical turn. These final notes in Howes and Donnelly's books and others put history in the hands of young adult readers. So um, we're running out of time, so I'm going to skip forward a little bit. Um, I discuss at length um, the call to arms on the Merchant House Museum um, website because um, they, I, I quote the entire thing at length, so I'm going to skip past this and just tell you that I, I quote this at length because it represents why preservation of 19th century New York is so hard. New construction can can't cause damage not only when restoring or renovating buildings on property, but further on adjacent properties or even properties within the block. In a city that never sleeps, construction never ends. Housing is a necessity in New York City, and so many of the older homes have been converted into multifamily living spaces. I end this piece with a note that began it. There just isn't that much of 19th century New York City left. And that which is left is in constant danger of being destroyed. Young adult literature is a market that has bloomed in the last 10 years. And while many academics and critics discount the importance of young adult literature, um, I looked to my own colleague who once asked me upon hearing I had initiated and begun to teach a young adult class, quote, when are kids gonna read real books? We can see that authors are not discounting the intelligence and hunger for information that their audiences have. A bibliography in the back of a book suggests to the young adult reader that she can continue the conversation of the novel if she so wishes. A recognition of space and acknowledgments offers the young adult reader an opportunity to explore the very real spaces of the literature that he has enjoyed. The young adult reader, in short, is expected to further their reading and explore the world around them because their favorite characters have done so. I see further evidence that authors recognize their readers' desires to invest in the world of their books. The Harry Potter experience, Platform 9 and 3 quarters, all of these spaces have become literary reality. And the places that are reality have become literary. We must, like our authors, trust in the intelligence and curiosity of young adult readers to know more. In a world in which education and labor departments may become merged, where the liberal arts and humanities are discounted, where screens take the place of books, we must encourage, above all else, the intelligence and curiosity that leads to action. Thank you. So right now we have a Q&A session. Uh, we have a few questions here. I will let you ask the question. Uh, I'll be moderator. Um, we had a question from uh, Jackie. So what are some of the connections you made between your time and study in England and your time in American areas? You mentioned ghost tours and the like. So it makes me wonder of the connections in the history there. Yeah, so um, what was so great about this um, particular National Endowment for the Humanities was that it was on material culture and we used New York City as our classroom. We went to Weeksville, we went to, um, uh, you know, Brooklyn to, to walk a, a Walt Whitman um, trail. We, I mean, we, we did so many different aspects and explored so much of New York City um, that I, I started thinking about spaces as opposed to just fashion, which I usually do fashion and material culture. Um, I started thinking about furniture. I started thinking about um, the physicality of spaces. And so um, when I went back to, when I went to England um, in March, when I had to unfortunately abruptly leave because COVID happened, <laughs> but um, I started thinking about spaces there as well. Um, the co-editor and I um, are actually thinking about doing um, another collection 
at some point on literary tourism. So sort of thinking about spaces again and thinking about, um, she does work on literary tourism with William Shakespeare. And I've been wanting to do um, literary tourism um, and explore the Brontes actually, the, the, the Haworth and everything like that. So um, it's, I, it, it opened my mind to thinking of material culture as something bigger than just clothes, right? Like this, this work in the workshop and, you know, thinking of what can be a canonical, a canonical text. In the, um, in the book, we originally started with ideas of, of rewriting canonical text and spaces, right? Like thinking about um, what does it mean to rethink the canon? Um, which is important because the canon tends to be a lot of dead white guys, right? And so we really want to rethink the canon and start thinking about, you know, how do we bring marginalized voices to the forefront? Um, you know, thinking through those things, um, reading um, uh, the working class investigative journalism actually inspired me to um, look at working class poetry in my current book project. Um, and so I did some explorations of uh, working class factories and spaces that way. So the two the two projects talk to each other in really interesting ways. And then there's a possible third project that may happen at some point, right? Like, so, yeah, I don't know if that answered your question, but <laughs> that's how I think of all these things sort of connecting, like little connective tissues, like just sort of trailing off, so. I was curious if either the tenement house or the old merchant's house have done any research with their visitors to see if they were inspired to visit because they read these young adult novels. Do they sell these young adult novels in their gift shops if they have any? Or do they ever invite these authors to come and give presentations at these sites to encourage people to go there? As far as I know, no, right? Like, so the Tenement Museum does have a gift shop and there are, um, um, they do sell some children's books about tenements, right? So there are some children's books about tenements. Um, and uh, they and then they sell like socks, like fun socks. Like this is another, I don't know what that has to do with the tenement museum, but they sell fun socks. Um, and uh, I did not see this particular novel there. And the novel had been published two years before I went. So it, it would have been in, in public um, uh, publication by then. But, um, you know, I, I think that um, they would benefit really well from doing something like that, right? Like thinking through um, how, to, how to advertise their home. And like, I'm, I would be really curious to see if we have a lot of uh, influx of young adult visitors, right? Of adolescent visitors to these, to these from reading this. Um, yeah, so unfortunately the answer as far as I know is no, right? Um, and, uh, although the Merchant House Museum is very invested in its ghost history, so maybe we have to, like, have an experience to get at the, at the Merchant House. Like, they were, they had, like, it was, I mean, like, they were creepy. It was really interesting, so, and I know Tamara does work on, on ghosts, so, in particular, so I think that would be really awesome for you, Tamara. Well, that's how they get people in the door. Yeah. They're fascinated with the ghost stuff. I, a big problem that I'm running into with uh, high school students, uh, especially via this, and I'm not going to miss the opportunity to ask you about it, uh, that they're sick of reading, that they're running into the standardized test system and beating their head is against the wall whenever they have to read something. Like right now, you talk about, and we've talked about before, the canon of the de uh, old dead white guys we're currently reading To Build a Fire by Jack London. Uh-huh. So... Uh, I did not like Jack London, sorry. <laughs> no, it's it's a good story, but they're struggling with it, and I feel that, uh, is there, like, I know it's the million-dollar question for all teachers, but have you thought of any ways of reaching them more? That's my question. <laughs> yeah, so that's, that's, a, that's a huge, big, important question, right? Um, I, I think it's important that we think about... Um, kids reading for fun and kids reading for school. I think that kids don't equate the two things together. If you're not a reader, like, you know, I was a nerd and I like would open my textbooks and just read because I was a nerd and I wanted to read everything. But, um, you know, for some kids, they don't, they don't have that drive or they don't even have the access to books, right? Like, you know, they may live far away from a library and have no um, transportation, right? Like they may not have money to buy books, right? 
Um, so I, I would say a couple of things. When I used to teach for Duke Talent Identification Program, I had some students who were from um, various socioeconomic brackets, various racial and ethnic backgrounds. And um, a lot of them uh, either had a phone or access to a computer. So I would introduce them to Gutenberg, Project Gutenberg, which is all the free um, classics. I think up to, is it 1924 is our new date? Does anybody know? I think, I think it's 1924. I think we now have up to 1924 um, in, the, in the public domain. But Project Gutenberg is entirely um, uh, uh, volunteer run and they have all the classics. So that's one way to get students invested. Um, another way is to show them like the fun in the classics. Um, I, when I teach Jane Austen, I always point out the sex because nobody thinks there's sex in Jane Austen. And I'm like, there's all kinds of sex in Jane Austen. Like everything in Jane Austen is sex, sex <laughs> and money. That's all it is. And <laughs> so, um, you know, I think like pointing out um, what, what could be so-called dangerous or, or, you know, like something that's a little naughty. Um, right. And, and then I, one of my big um, things that I like to do is to pair a canonical text with a contemporary text. And so um, I often use young adult literature in this way. So teaching Chaucer's uh, Canterbury Tales and then pairing it with Sometimes We Tell the Truth, which has uh, a gender binary character, it has discussions of um, rape, it has discussions of um, uh, you know, same sex love. I mean, like it, it just, it does all these beautiful things to rewrite Chaucer. I think would give people um, an insight, not just into Chaucer, but to into, you know, like Chaucer himself was talking about all those things too, right? Like the, the writer who wrote, Kim Zarens, who wrote Sometimes We Tell the Truth, um, didn't just make this stuff up, right? <laughs> like she's getting this from Chaucer. So, um, you know, doing Dracula and then not Twilight, but like thinking about another vampire text, other than Twilight. Stay away from Twilight. Right, right. Um, you know, thinking about like what we could do with Dracula, what, how we could um, think about the figure. Like one of the things I do when I teach um, anything that's like um, about vampires or we talk about vampires, we talk about the 1980s AIDS epidemic and how like the rush of vampire text started in the 1980s, like the Lost Boys, for example, Interview the Vampire, all of those different things. And, um, you know, pointing out this contemporary, well, I'm a, new, I'm a new historicist critic, which means that I look at history and literature together, right? So mm -hmm. that's another way too, to kind of point out, this is what's happening in the history around the time. Like, this is how you can have access into these spaces. I know that doesn't necessarily answer your question because I wish I had a magical answer for you and I don't. Right. Um, like I said, it's the million dollar question. With it is the million it. dollar question, right? Like close reading, right? Like close reading I find really helps. Like, you know, um, you were in my class 444. Yeah. And we did that close reading of the first page and a half of Hunger Games, right? Like mm -hmm. showing them that you can have like, you know, discussions of feminism, uh, race, ethnicity, Marxism, all of those different things in a page and a half, like may get them interested in the book. Because we paired it with uh, Maya Angelou's uh, uh, Still I, Still I Rise. Still I Rise, yeah. Yeah. So, so we're pairing it with like Survival and Hope and all of that. And <laughs> the, I think part of our problem is that we have to stick, of course, to the standards yes. and we have to hit all of the standards and with the possibility of going uh, online again. Well, we, um, in 444, I, which I completely revamped because February, Amy was bright-eyed <laughs> and bushy-tailed before COVID. <laughs> bought new textbooks and, you know, plan to rewrite all my classes. And then August, Amy hates February, Amy. But um, I completely redid 444 and we're doing a lot of contemporary texts. And so we're yeah. actually using the standard. So we were looking at standard, oh, 8.23, I think of the Indiana, uh, for those of you who don't know, Indiana had, like, there's the Common Core standards for all the other um, states, and then Indiana has its own Common Core, right? Special. Like, Indiana made its own thing, but we used it with um, everyday use. Um, we did that, and then we did um, Cell One, um, and so Adachi, and then, um, so what we were looking at is um, how you can talk about heritage and culture within text. So I think there's some really interesting free contemporary stuff out there too. That can okay. be brought in, 
you know, and poetry is usually the easy way to go because it's short and it's something you can bring in on your own. So I can send you that syllabus if you want to see it, John, to see what the new stuff is. Yes, please. Doing. Yeah, just email me. I'll send it to you. Okay, will do. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Uh, well, that, perfect, because mine actually kind of follows up John. Since uh, academia is still, in its way, loves the canon so much, um, and since you are studying, I mean, what is almost a genre within a genre within a genre, that you're, you're looking at uh, adaptations in young adult written by generally not white men who are not dead, like, are you, have you experienced much pushback? Is academia ready for uh, the, the research you're doing? Is, it is, uh, is English as welcoming as history, as welcoming as other, uh, other aspects of academia? So that's a great question. Um, no. <laughs> um, I, uh, because I, so I, I span two fields as Erska was kind enough to introduce um, at the beginning. So I work 18th, 19th century British and I do 21st century young adult. And um, I love USI because USI lets me play in both of my sandboxes, right? And the thing that ties them together is material culture. That's where um, everything that I do is tied together through material culture and history. Um, I do get a lot of pushback, not, not from administration. I, you know, I, I've, I've been really lucky with CLAFTAs and Laura's on my research. Um, CLAFTAs are uh, faculty development awards for research and um, Laura's are the, are the course releases. Um, but some of my colleagues, uh, in fact, uh, here in other places don't consider young adult to be a real genre. Right. When in fact, it's not even a genre, it's a it's an audience, right, with multiple genres within it. Um, and but I got I get the same thing from the work I do in the 19th century as well, because I work with fashion and it's considered a, you know, feminine thing. So therefore, it's not important. Right. Um, so I, I spend a lot of time defending what I do. Um, as, as you well know, and uh, he's my husband, so he knows these things. Um, and so, um, but I, I think that w the more work we do in this area, the more we prove that it's worth it, right? So I find a lot of success in um, Children's Literature Association. I've been published in the Children's Literature Association quarterly. I have an article coming out at the Lion and the Unicorn, and these are two of the major um, publications, like the, the pinnacle publications in children's and young adult literature. Um, I've been published in both of those. I've published um, and I've co-edited two collections on young adult literature that have been well received and well reviewed. Um, okay, well, this one just came out yesterday, but we're gonna say that it's gonna be well received and well reviewed, right? Um, and- uh, I like it. <laughs> it's really good. Uh, we did, like, if you find a typo, don't ever tell me because it went through like 15 people. And if it does exist, that typo is meant to live. Like, that's the typo that would not die, right? But, um, you know, I think that there is such a stigma in academia against genre fiction. So, one of the things I do in Brit Lit when I do my um, introduction to Brit Lit class is we talk about how what we do is genre. Jane Eyre is a gothic novel right? Dracula is a gothic novel. These are popular fiction that we have now, you know, canon, like put in the canon when in fact, you know, they were popular at the time. And so one of the questions we had in class just last week was um, we were doing Beowulf on Thursday. No, Tuesday. I, I don't remember what day it is. We did Beowulf on Tuesday. And I asked, you know, what of our contemporary texts are still going to be around in a thousand years that is popular? Are people going to be studying Twilight? I know I keep picking on Twilight, but like, you know, think about it. Like, are we going to have Twilight scholars a thousand years from now that are picking apart the language and looking at sparkling vampires as, as you know, symbolic of our country and our, and our time period, right? Um, and the way that we're looking at Grendel. And so that's, I think, by pointing out like how uncanonical the canon is, is where I start a lot of my hard work. I think would, would be an answer to that question, right? And I just, I just keep doing my thing and I do it well. So <laughs> like, I do, I do it well and I do it, I do it, keep doing it. So like eventually someone will have to listen to me. That's, that's sort of, I'm an only <laughs> child. That's just sort of like what I learned growing up. Like if you just keep bugging people enough, like they'll, they'll listen, so. I'm in, uh, I'm in Virginia and I work a lot with Appalachian children's literature and young adult literature and folklore. And um, 
I just had a thought when um, the other person was asking about, you know, tourism around some of these sites and young people and so on, because um, Serafina novel, fairly well known um, novels, um, and they're set at the Biltmore House in North Carolina. Yes, I know of them. I haven't read them. Freezing again. So an example where I think there's a good bit of tourism going on is at the Biltmore House in yes. North Carolina. Yes. So I, I went down there not long enough to do some of the literary tourism things, but I was very interested in touring the house because of having read those young adult novels. Great, great. Uh, and and there's a, and of of course it's set in you know this incredibly famous you know mansion castle of America of rich people, but the novels raise some interesting questions about the working people there. Yes. And I thought, oh, this is such a glowing portrait of the Vanderbilts, but apparently a lot of it is quite true about the Vanderbilts, you know, treating people well and starting a school for the working people and that kind of thing. But I haven't studied it in depth yet. <laughs> Yeah, one of the um, things I'm doing with my um, 19th century project is I'm looking at um, uh, factory cities or factory villages that they built with schools and, and giving uh, work to working class women in, in a safer environment. But then, you know, you have the sort of the, the capitalist, you know, doing well that ne not necessarily in the best interest of the people. So we have to kind of watch all that with a grain of salt. Whenever I teach uh, any... 19th century class or 18th century class, I always include contemporary literature. So I'm teaching a Gothic class in the spring and I'm, we're doing The Likeness and Icarus Girl. Um, one is a Nigerian British text and one is an Irish text. So we look at I'm starting and ending the class, the 19th century class with those two different bookends um, to kind of point out, you know, like this is where the genre has gone. Okay, well, thank you very much for such a wonderful discussion. And the Thomas, thank you for your wonderful presentation and you all for, for attending our session. Thank you guys for coming. Appreciate you.